The Sign of the Beaver, Chapter 2 By the next morning, the tight place in his stomach was gone. By the morning after that, Matt decided that it was mighty pleasant living alone. He enjoyed waking to a day stretched before him to fill as he pleased. He could set himself the necessary chores without having to listen to any advice about how they should be done. How could he have thought that the time would move slowly? As the days passed and he cut one notch after another on his stick, Matt discovered that there was never time enough for all that must be done between sunrise and sunset. Although the cabin was finished, his father had left him the endless task of chinking the spaces between the logs with clay from the creek bank. At the edge of the clearing, there were trees to fell to let in more sun on the growing corn, and underbrush that kept creeping closer over the cleared ground. All this provided plenty of wood to be chopped and stacked in the wood pile against the cabin wall. To cook a meal for himself once or twice a day, he had to keep a fire going. Twice in the first few days, he had waked and found the ashes cold. Back home in Quincy, if his mother's fire burned out, she had sent him or Sarah with her shovel to borrow live coal from a neighbor. There were no neighbors here. He had to gather twigs and make a wad of shredded cedar bark then strike his flint and blow on the tiny spark until it burst into flame. A man could get mighty hungry before he'd coax that spark into a cooking fire. The corn patch needed constant tending. In those hot, bright days, every drop of water that those green shoots demanded had to be lugged from the creek, a kettle full at a time, and there was no way to water the corn without encouraging the weeds as well. As fast as he pulled them, new ones sprang up, the crows drove him distracted, forever flapping about. A dozen times a day he would dash at them fiercely, shouting and waving his arms. They would just fly lazily off and wait on a nearby treetop till his back was turned. He dared not waste his precious powder on them. At night, wild creatures nibbled the tops of the green shoots. Once he sat up all night with his rifle across his knees, batting at mosquitoes. When morning came, he stumbled into the cabin and slept away half the day. That was the second time he let the fire go out. He seemed to be hungrier than ever before in his life. The barrel of flour was going down almost as fast as when two were dipping in it. He depended on his gun to keep his stomach filled. He was still proud of that gun, but no longer in awe of it. Carrying it over his shoulder, he set out confidently into the forest, venturing further each day certain of bringing home a duck or a rabbit for his dinner. For a change of diet, he would take his fish pole and follow the twisting course of the creek or walk the trail his father had blazed to a pond some distance away. In no time, he could catch all the fish he could eat. Twice he had glimpsed a deer moving through the trees just out of range of his rifle. One of these days, he promised himself, he would bring one down. It was a good life, with only a few small annoyances like buzzing mosquitoes inside his head. One of these was the thought of Indians. Not that he feared them. His father had been assured by the proprietors that his new settlement would be safe. Since the last treaty with the tribes, there had not been an attack reported anywhere in this part of Maine. Still, one could not entirely forget all those horrid tales and he just didn't like the feeling he had sometimes that someone was watching him. He couldn't prove it. He could never see anything more than a quick shadow that might be a moving branch. But he couldn't shake off the feeling that someone was there. One of those pieces of advice his father had been so fond of giving had been about Indians. They won't bother you, he said. Most of them have left for Canada. The ones who stayed don't want to make any trouble. But Indians take great stock in politeness. Should you meet one, speak to him just the same as to the minister back home. Matt had seen his father follow his own advice. Once, when they had tramped a long way from the cabin, they had seen in the distance a solitary dark figure. The two men had nodded to each other gravely and lifted a hand in salute, exactly as if they had been two deacons passing in the town square. But how could you be respectful to a shadow that would not show itself. It made Matt uneasy. 
He had grown used to the stillness. In fact, he knew now the forest was rarely quiet. As he tramped through it, he was accompanied by the chirruping of the birds, the chatter of squirrels, and the whine and twang of thousands of bothersome insects. In the night, he could recognize now the strange sounds that used to startle him. The grunt of a porcupine rummaging in the garden. The boom of the great horned owl. Woo-hoo! The scream of some small creature pounced upon in the forest. Or the long, quavering cry of the loon from the distant pond. The first time he had heard the loon call, he had thought it was a wolf. Now he liked to hear it. Mournful as it was, it was the cry of another living creature. Matt would worm his shoulders into a comfortable spot in the hemlock boughs that made his mattress, pull the blanket over his head to shut out the mosquitoes, and fall asleep, well satisfied with his world. He would have liked, however, to have someone to talk to occasionally. He hadn't reckoned on missing that. For much of the day, he was content to be alone, tramping through the woods or sitting on the bank of the creek, dangling his fish line. He was like his father in that. But there were times when he had thought he'd like to share with someone, with anybody, even his sister Sarah, though he'd never paid much mind to her at home. So he was not so quick-witted as he would have been when unexpectedly someone arrived. And we'll read chapter three next time. Till then, as Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Thanks for listening. Love you guys. Bye-bye.